Good evening. We are tonight uh, going to be starting out in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And like I announced to you last week, we're going to do two um, <clears throat> miracles tonight. We're going to look at the, the uh, man that had leprosy that Jesus healed in Matthew 8. And then partway through, we're going to go over to Luke 17 and look at probably what is the more famous of the two miracles, and that is the healing of the ten lepers. Um, two, two totally different events, but yet I'm linking them because of the leprosy and, and looking at that. And so that's how I'm doing some of the miracles that aren't as, aren't as I guess you maybe say, there's not as much written about them and that we can cover uh, two in a class. And so we're going to do those uh, this evening. So, the um, one in Matthew 8 is in verses 1 through 4. Now, the, the pr three previous chapters, we know what the three pre previous chapters are about, don't we? What, what, are the, what are Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Sermon on the Mount, okay? So, the Sermon on the Mount. So, chapter 8 begins with the line, when he came down from the mountain, Okay? So this is just right after coming down off of the mountain. And so he came down off the mountain. Great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now I'll stop right there. If you look at, and um, if you look at, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, there is a, there's a lot there. It's an interesting reading in, in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. And it's all about what you do if you find yourself with a skin disease, in particular leprosy. Now, leprosy was a catch-all. You could have any number of different skin diseases, and they would have called it leprosy. So... It maybe wasn't exactly those things, but that's what they call it. And so if you developed a skin disease, you were to go to the priest, and the priest was to determine the extent of what you have, whether or not it was leprosy, and whether or not you could go back to the general population or not. And if you were determined to have leprosy, you were not allowed to go back home. You were had to go to a place separate from the camp or the, or the village or wherever they were. You had to, to stay away from other people except for that had leprosy. You were to wear old clothing so as to not, so as to be easily recognized, uh, clothing that was tattered and worn. And you were to call out to people that if you encountered them so that they would not walk past you. You were to call out that you were unclean and you were to keep your distance and you were to stay away. We see that a little bit in the next one we're going to look at. In Luke 17, it says that the ten were standing afar off and they called out to him. Okay, So they, they uh, do that. They are, they're off in the distance. But this man is, you know, he, he would know because he would have undoubtedly been to a priest. And here he is, he is separated, he is a leper, and he comes and he bows down in front of Jesus. That's really a massive no-no uh, as far as what they were supposed to do. He was supposed to stay at a distance and keep his distance from, from anybody and everybody. And then you see him, he comes and kneels before Jesus. That is something... That is something very bold for a leper to do, um, to, to come and come to Jesus. Because look here and see what it says. He came down from the mountain and great crowds are following him. He has a lot of people following behind him. And he has a man with, in their day and time, the scariest disease on the planet. I mean, they, they didn't really know about things like cancer and 
and, and other kinds of diseases like we would. And so they would, they would label those kinds of things as other things. But a disease in which your body dies one inch at a time is a scary thing. Now today, there is leprosy in the world. But leprosy is only really found in, uh, you know, in, in any kind of regularity in nations like uh, India and some parts of Africa and others where sanitation is not so, um, so good. I've heard Steve and others talk about seeing lepers and being around leper colonies in, uh, in India and other places. And so, you know, that's, a, that's something that if it does ever happen in the United States and they ever identify it, it's easily curable, easily fixable if you catch it early. But unkept, unchecked, and runs its course, it's about always fatal. For them, it would have been just about always fatal. And so it was very much a death sentence. And I can't imagine any more lonely way to die than the way the lepers had to die. I mean, you die a little bit at a time, and you die separated from your family and friends. You know, off in a leper colony. But he, he comes, falls before Jesus. Very bold thing for a leper to do. And then he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now that is a very bold statement as well. Part of why it's so bold is because this is very early in the ministry of Christ. Okay? This is early on. We don't know exactly where. Um, you know, most, most scholars classify the changing the water to wine as the first miracle, and it could well have been. But, but um, it says it's the first of the signs in, in the book of John. It doesn't necessarily say it's the first miracle. This could be, could be, I'm saying, could be a miracle even earlier than that. It could be maybe even the first of the miracles. Um, the signs listed in John or the signs listed by John that John used to prove that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what John was all about. Not necessarily to record that that was the first miracle, but it's the first one of the signs that he recorded. And, and, and apparently... Um, I don't have any problem with, with labeling it the first miracle because, you know, it, is, it does seem to be that way. But this is very early on, okay? Anyway, whether that's the first one or not, this one's early on in the ministry of Christ. And so for him to have come to this conclusion that Jesus could do this is the point I'm making. For him to come to this conclusion that Jesus could do this and, and come so boldly is really a remarkable thing because we really don't know at this point of him having cleansed any other lepers that we know of. And so because this is so early in his ministry, it's not something that, uh, you know, he, he had cleansed every affliction and such as it mentions at the end of chapter 4, but there's, there's quite a few things that they've been doing, but this is an early thing into the ministry of Christ. So um, one of his earlier miracles that we have recorded. But he comes boldly, he comes and bows down before Jesus, and he says, if you will, you can make me clean. What, um, what is remarkable is the, the, the thing that Jesus does. And that's in verse 3. Jesus sa it says, and he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Now, what is remarkable is, he touched him, then he healed him. You know, if you came in contact with a leprous individual, you would be considered unclean yourself and would have to be somewhat quarantined until it was determined whether you caught it or not. Okay? Well, Jesus is going to remove all doubt whether he caught it or not in just a moment. But he touches him and then he heals him. And 
you think about the amazingness of that. That if you're a leper separated from the people, what would you want most? To be close to people. You know, and we don't know how long he had leprosy or anything like that, but, but the thing probably he would have missed most is the close contact with family and friends. A handshake, a hug, or whatever. You know, those kinds of things. But Jesus touches him, and then he heals him. What's interesting also is Jesus doesn't say anything before he touches him. He touches him, and I can't imagine what the, what the crowd would have thought and the gasps that would have been taking place. You know, here's a man that's a leper. Everybody recognizes that. And so he touches him, and then he heals him. I can't imagine, you know, I, I can just kind of see it in my mind's eye. The crowd's following him off the mountain, and they see a leper coming. And whoop, they put on the brakes, you know, and, and they stop. And Jesus has the man fall at his feet. And Jesus touches him and then says, I will be clean. And it says, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And so it wasn't something that took place over time. It was something that took place immediately. What you'll notice is, this miracle here, he touches him and heals him. Um, When we look at Luke 17... There is no indication at all that he touches him. But in fact, if you remember, if you looked at this or remember the text in Luke 17, that they cry out, the ten lepers cry out, uh, have mercy on us. And Jesus says, to them, they, they indicate they have leprosy. And Jesus said, you're cleansed, go show yourself to the priest. There's zero indication that Jesus laid a hand on any one of those ten. Jesus touches this man and heals him. The very next section in Matthew 8 is Jesus healing a centurion servant. Okay? And that's the man that Jesus said, that, that Jesus said, I'll come and, and heal him. And, and the centurion said, I'm a man of authority and a man under authority. I'm not worthy as a centurion. I'm not worthy for, this man, for you to come into my house. You just say the word and my servant will get better. And Jesus remarked at his faith and said, it'll be done as you said. And he goes home and he finds out his servant got better at the time Jesus said. So what do you notice? You have, you have some of the miracles that we'll look at later on in our study of Jesus healing the blind. Uh, one time in which he made some spit and, and takes some dirt and makes mud with it, sticks it on the man's eyes. Another time he sticks his fingers in a man's ears to, to, to clean out his deafness. This one he touches and heals the leprosy. Another time he heals him at a distance. The centurion servant, he heals him uh, when he's out of the area. Um, And and not even at the man's house, the servant, not where the servant is. When when Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethsaida that we looked at a few weeks ago, the the man, he asked the man what he, wanted, what he wanted if he wanted to get well. And he said, I've got nobody to let me in the water. And he says, get up and walk. He didn't ask to be healed. He asked to get into the water. Jesus healed him. You know what all this tells me and why? All these things are different. Jesus went about healing things like blindness in several different ways. He went about healing different sicknesses in different ways. Sometimes he was there. Sometimes he wasn't. Sometimes he touched an individual. Sometimes he spoke to the individual. Sometimes the individual was off away in the distance. Sometimes there is no magic formula to heal. The hem of the garment. He he didn't even, yeah. The woman woman that had the, uh, the, the bleeding disorder that she touched him and touched his coat in the middle of the crowd and he said who touched me of course he knew who had but and so all those different avenues show you that there is no magic formula that if you say these words and do this 
that you can heal. Okay? So it's not some magic spell that Jesus performed that could be duplicated or replicated by anybody else. It shows you that the power lie in the individual doing the healing and not in some kind of incantation or potion or saying the right words in the right order. Those kind of things were completely immaterial. It was Jesus chose different ways, I think largely to show that it wasn't in some saying some magic words or waving a magic wand or whatever, but it was all about him doing it as a show to the gospel, a show that he was the Son of God, a show that the message he was giving was true. And then after that, the apostles began doing the same things so that the apostles could show that they were performing miracles just like Jesus did. And if they're performing them just like Jesus did, then, then the conclusion people would draw is, the, the power that Jesus used, same power they're using, and that would be correct. Yes, Tom? Yeah, one thing I thought was kind of interesting, too. He told the centurion, he said, I haven't seen your, uh, much faithfulness in all of Israel as I've seen in you. Right. And, and something people don't realize, that a Roman centurion would be a Gentile. I mean, this is before the church begins, so he's not a Christian, but, but this is a Gentile. I mean... If you, were to, if you were to ask a Jew what the poster boy of what was wrong with the world, it would be Roman centurions. Because those are the ones that ran the country. Oh, there was, a, there, was a, you know, there was a Caesar. But the guy they saw on a daily or weekly basis in their community that pushed them around, that made sure they paid their taxes, that made sure they had order, the face of the Roman Empire in a community would be the centurion. And so those centurions were not loved by the Jewish people. That one apparently was a good one. Um, that was one with faith and, remarks, and Jesus' remarks to that faith. And so you have that. Interestingly enough, all the centurions mentioned in Scripture actually are mentioned in a positive light, which is, is kind of interesting. They're, they're mentioned almost kind of like Samaritans are mentioned. That when they're mentioned, it's actually something uh, positive. <clears throat> and in that, in that time, that would have been a, a superior, a... Yeah, you would you would call you would call a a superior you would call them Lord, um, you know that that was the case. Now, let me let me give you a, a trick if you don't know about it in your translation. I would assume most everybody's translation is this: if if the meaning of the Greek word or the Hebrew word in the text is in calling this would be our equivalent of calling him sir. Okay, we would call an individual we want to respect. We'd say, "Sir," is what we would say. And if you look at that, if you look at the word "Lord," the L is capitalized, but the O R D is not. In in most every Bible, if it is Jehovah God or Jesus Christ, it's an all capital L O R D. It's uh, the the O R D is are capitalized. And so that's generally it. I can't say that's for all translations. And so the way that that would be taking this is um, to look at that as, um, you know, as in, as in a master or sir or whatever in that, in that regard. So, but yeah, he would call him Lord. But, but having said that, the fact that he's asking him to perform a miracle in this way would only show that he believes that this man is a prophet from God, etc. You know, that you wouldn't just ask anybody to do this kind of miracle, and he believes he can do it. And so, in that sense, calling him Lord certainly is one uh, way that would show that, that he is. 
you know, here he is. And, that, and that's a remarkable thing for a centurion to say. It's a remarkable thing for this leper to say. But in either case, referring to Jesus as Lord would have been a common thing. Uh, not, not necessarily meaning they believe he's the, the God of creation and, and all that. that, the that we, huh? Right. Yeah, and it, at the end of chapter 4, it says that he began uh, cleansing people of all kinds of diseases. I would assume that leprosy would be among that, and it says that he'd done that. So he had begun performing miracles. This is one of the very first ones we have specifically recorded. But, you know, he's performing these miracles, doing these things, and yeah, he's got faith that Jesus can do this, and he comes boldly. Because, see, if Jesus rejects him, He's, he's put himself out there because, you know, as a leper confronting people, I mean, that's, like I said, it's a pretty big no-no, but, but he does that. And Jesus does. He reaches out, touches him, and heals him. The leprosy's cleansed, and then Jesus says to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. And so, um, yeah, I think he probably, I, I'm not so sure even that Jesus didn't do reverse psychology because, you know, the text said great crowds are following him. So, I, there's, there's, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think that, I think this is the different instance that, yeah, he, people are going to find out about that, you know, even if the crowd coming off the mountain following him didn't didn't hear and see everything that was done, they're going to realize that he had healed this man. Yeah, yeah, Jesus healed him. He's completely healed. But what was he to do? He was to go follow the law of the land. You need to go show yourself to the priest. And they were to offer a gift. They were to offer, depending on their wealth, they would offer a couple pigeons or an animal sacrifice or whatever it was. They would offer a gift to, that, that they had. And that's, you can find all that stuff in Leviticus 13 and 14. And you can look at that, do the, do the gifts, and then you, you're, if, you're, if you're declared clean of the leprosy, well, then you can go back home and go back to your daily life, go back to being a full functioning member of society. But the priest has to sign off on, on that you did that. Yeah. Right. All those times were statements of one kind or another, and so yeah, the the, the miracles were were such that there was a statement made on on all of those. Any other? Yeah, Mark. A couple of things in my always amused me is the approach, like we said, Mark is telling him. He probably didn't want the priest to beat him up. Right. Right. And, and I'm sure that a lot of it went in there, and I'm sure they wondered why. But we have no clue whether he ever told them that there had to be a purpose for him not to say why. Because they may have crushed him in the process. Yeah. Yeah, it, it probably had, and, that, and that's, that's probably a good, a good point on that, that it probably has to do with not wanting to, to stir up trouble with the priests. And just 
not explain how you got healed. Just say, hey, it's gone. You know, it's been removed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and go from there and, and therefore not cause trouble any more than necessary. Okay, let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17, verse 11. This is later on in his ministry. And uh, Jesus is, in verse 11, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voice saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Let's stop there. Jesus is going in the area between Samaria and Galilee. And he's entering a village. He's on the outskirts of the village. He's entering the village. And he was met by ten lepers at a distance. And there's ten lepers. And nine of them, well, we don't know what those nine were. We... We can assume that they were Jews, but there's a Samaritan among them. And they're kind of in a no man's land between Samaria and and Galilee. And so, first off, the fact that they're all together shows me this. That there's not too much prejudice in a leper colony. (laughs) You know, if everybody there has got leprosy, they're not so worried about... Jew and Samaritan and all that, Um, you know. And I think there's some truth to that. If you recognize your problem, recognize your difficulty, recognize your own impurity, then, then you look and say, you know, we're not really that different, the Jew and the Samaritan. And so apparently there isn't the the the. Uh, prejudices in a leper colony. So that's one positive thing out of the leper colony, that they, they've got a Samaritan among them and it doesn't seem to be any problem. Because it's the Samaritan that we know, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the punchline, but it's the Samaritan later on that comes back and says, thank you to Jesus. We know the story. But, and so there's a Samaritan with the others. And so they apparently are able to get along with each other in the leper colony. And the ten of them, they're doing what they're supposed to. They stand at a distance and they lift up their voices and they say to Jesus, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, they don't specifically come out and say, heal us. But considering they have leprosy and they're standing at a distance, it doesn't take a genius to figure out. You don't have to be able to read minds to know what they want, okay? Uh, And so... You know, Jesus undoubtedly is able to figure that out. But they do this. They cry out to him. And so there they are, these ten. They cry out at a distance. Jesus, have mercy out on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. What's interesting is, is he doesn't heal them right away. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. Because the last part of the verse, 14, and as they went, they were cleansed. Now that took a little faith, didn't it? I have leprosy. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. I still have leprosy. And I'm going to the priest. Oh, wow. It's gone. Before I get there. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? You know, so they have some faith that causes them to start walking to the priest before they're healed. And it's only as they are on their way that they get the healing. There's a great lesson there, isn't there? That we should should be in obedience to Christ before we even see anything change in our life and change. So we do it His way because He says so even if we haven't noticed the change we want to have made. And so they, as they were going to the priest, 
get cleansed. So there they are. They have this faith. They have faith enough to cry out to Jesus. They have faith enough to start heading to the priest before they get cleansed. And in verse 15, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet. Now he comes to Jesus. Now he comes to Jesus' feet. He now comes boldly to him. He falls and worships him, giving thanks. And it says, now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, what did Jesus tell him to do? Okay. He said, go, go show yourself to the priest. That's what they had to do if they were cleansed, is they had to go show themselves to the priest, had to go offer the sacrifice, and, and then, you know, the priest, if they satisfied doing the, the sacrifices the way they were supposed to, then the priest would, would essentially give them a clean bill of health, and they could return to the community. Now, i got a question. How many Jewish priests, do you suppose, would be willing to look at a Samaritan's leprosy? I wonder if, as they walked out of sight, the, the Samaritan thought, now who do I go to? Because there's no, no Jewish rabbi that was going to look at his leprosy. Now, there likely were Samaritan priests of sorts, but not. So, in all fairness, there could have been those. We don't really have any indication of that, but and they because they did try to follow the old law, and so they would have followed the book of Leviticus. But um, but there was no there was no Jewish priest ready available that was going to care anything about his leprosy. And so as they're going, he realizes. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm cleansed. And so, instead of doing whatever he was going to do, go to the Samaritan priest, or simply go back home, or whatever his plan was, he changed whatever that was going to be, and he comes back to Jesus. And he falls down in front of him, and he worships him. And Jesus said, wasn't there ten? Where are the other nine? And then he said, and and is it just this foreigner that comes? And this is not a story Jesus is telling. This is not a parable that Jesus makes the Samaritan, like the good Samaritan hero. This is a real live event that ten are healed, and the one that comes back is the Samaritan. And so here it is that this man is grateful. He's thankful beyond, obviously, what the others are. Are they thankful? I bet they are. But they're not coming back to express that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a lesson for all that they would have been around there, I would imagine. But at the same time, the nine were doing exactly what he told them to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were doing exactly what he told them to do. And, and although they were doing what he told them to do, you know, this one came back to show the gratitude that he had. Now, you know, And that, and that could be. It could be that he didn't have a priest to go to, and so he came back. And so what did he do? He turned to any place he could. Came back to Jesus. Which is sometimes what we have to do. Yeah, which is sometimes what we have to do. Turn back to Jesus, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's clearly, a, that's clearly a part of this message that, you know, to let us know that, you know, we need to be thankful as well. And sometimes we're not very thankful. And, and it's only this one individual that came back and praised God. 
and thanked God for what had happened. And then he says to him, he says to him what is even a greater blessing, and that is rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. He makes a pronouncement upon him about his faith that didn't make upon everybody else. And, you know, there's a, there's a blessing for Jesus to say that upon him or over him, that your faith has made you well. And that statement hadn't been made to the others, although I think there's a, a clear idea that they had faith, but he makes that statement of proclamation over them and gives them that um, that um, statement. You wonder if everybody who knew him as a leper now automatically believes that he had leprosy. Yeah, you know, make, make does make you wonder that people that that you know that knew about his situation, and then that they they uh, they look at that and they see. Wow, now he's cleansed. And yeah, that, that, it's a great statement of faith that, that, they, that he would be able to be able to express. Even in Jesus saying, don't tell anybody, word's still going to get out. You know, he'll tell this family friend and, or this part of the family, and then they'll tell somebody and they'll say to five other people, now you can't tell anybody else. You know? Yeah. 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 And I'm like Mark, well, I, I think that he was told not to tell him that thing, but then he wanted to, eventually not to tell the priest. Which, yeah, I, I believe that's... Because the priest had the, had the authority to say that you're still unclean. Right, and that is by far the best, the most logical part of that, because if they, if they found out it was Jesus, and they, then they would refuse maybe to give him a clean bill of health, and thus, you know, not you know, just to be obstinate about it. So yeah, you know, it may be that that for their benefit and their situation. Yes, Mark. One more little wrinkle for the drinkers. Okay. Once the priests proclaimed them healed and they take their offering, the priests then had to examine their robes. And if the robes still had leprosy, they could have caught it again. Right. They could recatch it. Yeah, they had to. Yeah, they had to. They had to fully examine the robes they had. That they had. You know, they had to get cleansed. And yeah, yeah, it was a mess. Cause, cause I tell you what, it was the scariest thing that they could encounter. And the crazy thing is, is that proper hygiene of washing oneself and and clean drinking water and not bathing in the same water that you drink and all those kinds of things that we take for granted, that it was those kind of things that, that caused it, whereas we've realized that from, from, uh, from more modern times. And interestingly enough, maybe you don't know this, there, there are a couple dozen or so cases of leprosy in the United States each year. And they usually get cured quickly. Do you know what the number one way that people get leprosy in the United States is? We're not far enough in the South. Yeah, yeah the Louisianans are to know this. Armadillos. Yeah, I, heard, I think I heard Carol back there say it. You know, that's a, that's been, and I was told that was not true. That, well, it's rare to get it from them because there's millions of them around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess they got one Yeah, yeah. But but that's what they that's what they often attribute it right. to. But but it's easily cured, so you don't have to worry about it. And and the chances of you running into an armadillo, even where there are armadillos, it, that has it is pretty rare, even at that. Yeah. Yeah, they they would have considered they would have considered just about any aggressive skin disease. Uh, they would consider a melanoma, uh, like an eczema or a psoriasis, or some things that 
are pretty common for us that, you know, you treat with a little bit of cream and it's not a, that big a deal in the, in the scheme of things. But they consider all skin disorders that grew basically as a leprosy. Oh, yeah, they have to, yeah. And they were on the right track by doing all that cleaning and such because it was cleanliness issues that they had. Okay, next week we will look at Mark 5 and, then all, and also Luke 8. Both of those are the same miracle. And it's the miracle of uh, healing legion. The, the one, the guy that had the multiple demons that lived in the cemetery. That's, that's a fun one. And, and that's the one we'll look at. The text, the parallel texts of it are in Mark 5 and in, in Luke 8. Okay? And we'll just look at the section on the man known as Legion and, and healing him. He would have made graveside services interesting at that cemetery, to say the least. Um, anyway. Yeah, you would. You would. Yeah, you would think twice about hanging out in that cemetery. <laughs>